format today, we're going to have a lecture with Lawrence for an hour, and then we're going to have a 10 minute break, then a Q&A with Charlie Pickering, who's in the house, and then at the end, if you've got books, if you've brought books, we've got a signing in the corner, uh, which will be for free. If you haven't bought a book, you can purchase them down the back there. Okay, so without further ado, Lawrence Kraus. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hi. Hi. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I now I can hear myself now. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. This is it's great to begin my uh, this Australian tour here. And uh, I make for you to walk, li read that while, I, while the music was playing over and over and over again. But uh, um, I, did, I did change the piece once. But uh, so thank you. And I also want to thank Charlie also for, for, for doing this and promising that the Q&A will have after this was easier than the Q&A I had on his show this, this week. Uh, so or at least less uh, combative. But anyway, um, I want to talk about uh, reality which is a really nice thing to be able to talk about, because in the United States it's hard to talk about reality now. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but, but this is a quote, uh, actually a friend of mine, a filmmaker, Werner Herzog, told me about this book called The Peregrine. And it's, it's really a wonderful book, it's about a peregrine. And, um, uh, a, 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 and anyway, but it, th this is one of my favorite lines from it, the hardest thing of all to see is what is really there. And that's what I want to talk about. The, the fact that, that really what we've discovered, and the, the reason I wrote this book, is that the, the universe we see is an illusion. And the amazing history of science's effort to cut through the, the obfuscation of reality that we see, to understand the true reality underneath is, is the story I want to talk about. Now, it's a story, and so I, if I'm going to begin a story, I figure I, I, I want to begin by copying other good storytellers. So it's the best of times. And by that I mean that the Large Hadron Collider has turned on and has not created a black hole that's destroyed the world. That's a good time. But it's also the worst of times. Oh, well, let me get rid of Neil. But, uh, um, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, you know, I've avoided, I, it's great to get away from, from this guy. Um, although you can't because, you, you know, we're on this planet. Um, and, uh, although the Republican Party isn't. But anyway, um, but the, the great thing about talking about science is that, is that, as I want to talk about, not only does it allow us to say, this too shall pass, this is just a small glitch in a, in a cosmic history that's far broader, but I will actually, as I talk about the end, the science is more, is I think a key to fighting nonsense like this, as we'll talk about. But uh, anyway, the story I want to tell begins this way. This is, um, it doesn't really get that cold here. Maybe it does, I guess. Do you, do you ever have frost on your windows here? Good, excellent. Um, this is a windowsill in a, in a, in a, in a, or a window in, in the wintertime. And what I want to do is, is, so these are these beautiful ice crystals that have formed on the window. And imagine for a moment that your civilization grows up on one of these crystals. You live on one of these crystals. Say that one. Well, what would happen is there'd be scientists would come and determine, you know, that the laws of physics were different in this direction than that direction. The forces would be different in this direction than that direction. There'd be a per preferred direction in nature. It'd be that direction. And religions would spring up and explain why that direction was, was meant to be that way by God. And in fact, there'd be wars fought about whether the direction was there or there, which direction it was, or up or down, which is more important. And all of this would take incredible significance in the civilization that grew up on that ice crystal. But of course, with the luxury of being outside of it, we can see that that's just an accident, an accident of circumstances. There's nothing significant about that direction. And I wanna, what I want to tell you is that that's the world we live in, that what the world we see that we think is designed for us is, in fact, all the things that we think are so special about the universe in almost all ways are the same kind of accident. And it's an amazing story of how we got from there, here to there. And that's what I want to talk about today. So I want to start going back with this guy here, 
and whenever I ask who, who's this, people always say Aristotle. Um, but that's because Aristotle had a better press agent than Plato. Uh, but this is Plato. And when I was a kid in high school, I had to read Plato. I grew up in Canada, so I was educated. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, so Plato, I remember, I, I read The Republic, and there was a part of The Republic, a scene, that, or a, a chapter of it, that was really important, the allegory of the cave. And it always stayed with me. Plato imagined that we are, our image of reality is like people trapped in a cave. In fact, the, I, I want to just show you the image from my, here, here's the Im I, I found this in my high school textbook. And that shows how old I am, because this isn't copyrighted anymore. Okay. Uh, but it's, so he imagined that, that civilization, like people chained in a cave, to the back wall, only being able to see the back wall of a cave. And what they see are the shadows of reality. They, there's a fire behind them, and they can see people walking in a walkway. But they can't see the people. They see the shadows of the people. And that's their reality. And what he said is that the job of a philosopher, mathematician, scientist, or whatever, is to see those shadows and interpret the reality behind. And that was the challenge. And he said, well, and that's one version, but there's also, you can actually go out and see the real world out here with the sunlight. And he said, if someone were were to drag from there out to, the, out to the real world, the first thing would happen would be incredibly uncomfortable. You, suddenly, you'd, the bright light would hurt you. It'd be painful. And it'd be confusing. But eventually, you get used to it. And then, it would be much more interesting. And if you came, you wouldn't want to go back. But if you did go back, and you tried to explain to the people there what you actually saw, they'd think you were crazy. And as a, as a physicist who works in the forefront of what we're doing, that's, I know the feeling. Because it's so far removed from the universe of our experience that it does seem crazy. And, and it's a long set of steps, and that's a story that I wanted to tell those steps in, in detail in this last book. But the, this is a story I want you to remember because we're going we're gonna to talk about it again. This is also, by the way, interesting. It's a, all stories are a product of their times, the culture of their times. And this picture was drawn in the 1950s when my high school textbook was made. And you can see that the, 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 the people who are chained to this cave are, are, are scantily clad women in bikinis. Okay, so it's a product of the 1950s, which is historically inaccurate because if it were Plato's time, it'd be little boys, actually, um, in any case. But let me, so what would these people see? For example, for these people, length would have no meaning. This length of this pointer means something to us. But for them, length would have no meaning because objects that they would see would change their length regularly. For example, let's say there was a, a shadow of a clear plastic ruler, okay, at one, uh, on the wall. And at another time of day, the shadow would look like that. The ruler would change its length. So for those people, length wouldn't have a meaning. They might not even have a word for length. The philosopher or mathematician would look at this and say, ah, or if they were sufficiently good, they'd say, no, you know what? There is a meaning of length. But the problem is the world we live in isn't just two-dimensional, because they're seeing a two-dimensional image on a wall, the shadow. They'd say the real world is three-dimensional. And that would explain this weird fact that length changes. So for example, if you're looking from above, there's a, the shadow of a ruler. But if I were to rotate the ruler in that extra dimension, perpendicular to the wall, if I rotate it, then the projection of the ruler on the wall gets smaller. So they, they would say, I can understand this weird property, but it really would mean that the real world is very different than the illusion we see. The real world has an extra dimension. It's three-dimensional. And that would be a property of a discovery of science that is, is, is characterized by the modern discoveries of science. In physics, whenever we see two things which on the surface seem extremely different, but are seen to be different reflections of the same thing, that's a hallmark of progress. And we'll see it again and again. So remember this example, because now I want to jump forward by a whole bunch of centuries to the modern people who helped us see the shadow through the shadows of reality today. And this is one of my favorite physicists, the greatest experimental physicist of the 19th century, Michael Faraday. And Michael Faraday 
uh, well, he was, he was a wonderful uh, human being, but he was also, it was interesting, he had no formal education, none whatsoever. He was a bookbinder's apprentice. And he created a precedent which I like to tell my students about, because he, which is to always suck up to your professors. <laughs> because what he did is he attended the lectures of Humphrey Davy, who was the head of the Royal Institution. And he attended them and he took beautiful notes. And then he bound them in a book and presented them to Humphrey Davy and said, here's a, a book with your lectures in it. By the way, can I be your assistant? And of course, he knew, he obviously was a student. He knew about academic ego and he, and he became uh, Humphrey Davy's assistant and later on rose to be the director of the Royal Institution himself and the greatest experimental physicist of the 19th century. He created the modern world we live in, in many ways, with his discoveries. And, and there's story, there are lots of apocryphal stories about him uh, and, and because he was doing forefront science, which at the time didn't have any obvious practical significance. And so one of my favorite stories is of Gladstone, the Prime Minister, coming into his laboratory with all these wheels and jumping frogs and other things and saying, of what use is any of this? And he said, of what use? Why, well, one day you'll tax us for it, okay? And, you'll, and it's true, because what Faraday discovered were the laws of physics that produced everything in this room, the lights, the video, and everything we see, which I'll talk about in a second. But the first thing he did, which is interesting for me, is because he wasn't, had no formal education, he, he wasn't comfortable with mathematics, and so he thought in pictures. And he tried to understand, he actually asked himself a question which Newton had asked in, earlier and never really answered. He said, when two electric charges attract or repel, how does this charge know where the other charge is? And it was a real question. Newton never answered it. But Faraday said, I can understand this if I picture around each electric charge these lines that go out to infinity. I'll call them field lines. So, and the number of lines will depend upon the size of the charge. If there's more charge, there are more lines. And then, if I put another charge here, it'll know what to do because it feels the field right there, so it'll, it'll be repelled in that direction, or repelled in that direction, or that direction, or that direction. And the strength of the force repelling us will be depend on how many field lines are in the vicinity. And this is not just a, a good analogy, it's exact. It reproduces the mathematics exactly, but he, he didn't... He wasn't comfortable with the mathematics. It was a picture that was exact. And in fact, for multiple charges, it's even better because you just, the field lines can't cross each other. So if I put two positive charges there, the field lines sort of repel each other here. And it, once again, if you ask, if I put another positive charge, what will happen to it? Well, here it'll be repelled in that direction, in this direction, in that direction. And again, here it'll be repelled with twice the force it would be here because there's twice as many field lines in the vicinity. Once again, this reproduces things exactly. So it was a mental crutch for him, for a guy who wasn't comfortable with mathematics. Okay? That's great. Again, hold that thought. That, but that's not why we know Faraday, not from this, this invention of field lines. It was for this accident. Because in that time, people had been experimenting with electricity and magnetism. And, as I am right now, apparently. Um, and, it had been discovered that there was some relationship between the two. They're, they're, they, they're, they're different on the, on the face of it. But the French had discovered if I have a, 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 a charge and I move it in a, in a wire and make a current, it makes a magnet. Many of you played with electromagnets. I hope all of you have at some point in your life. Okay, so a moving charge produces a magnet. So they suddenly said, okay, if there's a relationship between a moving charge and a magnet, then can a magnet, so a charge can produce a force on a magnet by moving. Can a magnet produce a force on a charge? Can a magnet produce an electric force? And they tried, they brought magnets up to charges, and nothing happened, and Faraday played with this for a long time. And one day, by accident, he had these two current loops. They weren't current loops, just wires. And he hooked up to a battery, and he, and he closed the switch on, one, on the battery, so a current started flowing in this wire. And suddenly, he noticed a current flowing in that wire for a little bit. And then he turned off the battery, and then another current would flow again. And what he discovered was that a changing magnetic field, because when I close the battery, close the switch, so the, the current starts to flow, a magnetic field starts to form. It increases. When the magnetic field was increasing, that's when a current would flow here. When I turn it off so the magnetic field was decreasing, another current would flow here. So what he discovered was that a changing 
magnetic field will produce a force on a charge, it will produce an electric field. He discovered that connection in the other direction. Suddenly, electricity and magnetism began to be tied much more closely. And that is why, by the way, he was absolutely right about taxing us, because that's, that's how we produce electric power right now. The way we produce power, in any, you know, whether it's nuclear power or, or, or in a hydroelectric dam or wh whatever, we just have current loops, wires, rotating in a magnetic field. Water comes and causes the wires to rotate, and as the wire moves through the magnetic field, it causes a current to flow. And that produces the electricity that powers everything we see, and that's, we get taxed for it. So, not only was he right about that, but literally it created modern civilization. You could not have almost anything here if he hadn't made that accidental discovery. Okay. But he didn't have, he, he, the discovery was not everything. And he didn't have the ability, the theoretical physics ability to put that together. The guy who did was this guy, the greatest theoretical physicist of the 19th century, James Clerk Maxwell, who was an, uh, another remarkable human being and, and was a prodigy, in fact, and uh, he, he, it's interesting, he, he was Scottish, and he, um, he got a professorship in, in Glasgow, and uh, he had already, at that point, explained the rings of Saturn and a ton of things, but this is just a, such a typical academic story, because um, these two universities merged together, and they had two professors of physics, but they only needed one when they merged, so what did they do? They threw, they threw Maxwell out and kept the guy we never heard of anymore. And the same thing happened to him in Edinburgh, so he had to go down to Cambridge and for a while. And there he developed, he put together the results of, of, of Faraday and, and actually fixed things up mathematically and produced a beautiful theory, the unification of electricity and magnetism. What he showed with four equations is that electricity and magnetism are exactly the same thing. One person's electricity is another person's magnetism. They are two different sides of the same coin. And he then did a, a calculation, which is, for me, one of the best calculations you can ever do as an undergraduate in physics. But the, the phenomenon is the following. So say I take a charge and I start to shake it up and down, okay? What happens? Well. Right. The charge starts moving, that means I create a magnetic field, so that, but the magnetic field is changing, so I create an electric field, because a changing magnetic field produces an electric field. But the electric field is also changing if the charge is constantly changing, so the changing electric field produces a magnetic field, but the changing magnetic field produces an electric field, and if I shake a charge here, I produce this disturbance in electric and magnetic fields that propagates throughout space. And what he showed is, if you do two experiments in the laboratory, first measure the strength of the force between two charges, then measure the strength of the force between two magnets, and take those two numbers. In terms of those two numbers, he could calculate the speed of that disturbance. And what did he discover? Is that the speed of, and I think I, just, I have a picture of the disturbance so you can watch it for a second. The speed of that disturbance, and this is the wonderful calculation that you can do as an undergraduate, turns out to be the speed of light. And he discovered that light was nothing other than an electromagnetic wave. A disturbance in electric and magnetic fields that propagates at a speed, and the speed could be determined by measuring the strength of electricity in the laboratory and the strength of magnetism in the laboratory. And first of all, by the way, is, the amazing thing is these fields which Faraday had invented in his mind just as a mental crutch because he couldn't do the math were not just mental crutches, they were real. They were as real as the hand in front of your face because you couldn't see the hand in front of your face if it weren't for them because the light we see is due to these fields. Okay. And, then, and that's why, and, and, but he sub discovered something that people had wondered for a long time. What is light? Light is an electromagnetic wave and that's why undergraduate physics students have these t-shirts with the four Maxwell's equations on them, the four Maxwell equations, and then underneath it says, let there be light, okay? Because unlike the Bible, it explains it, okay? You, you get the four equations, you got light, okay? It tells you what's there. Okay, great. This was the first great unification in the modern era. These two things that were very different on the surface, electricity and magnetism, were shown by Maxwell 
to be literally the same thing. That, that kind of unification is, and that changed everything. It made the modern world possible. Okay, now that led to this next guy who you do recognize, Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein wouldn't have been Albert, well, he would have been Albert Einstein, but you wouldn't have heard of him if it hadn't been for Maxwell and Faraday. Now, I get lots of, I get lots of email every day, and, and I get letters that go like this. Well, the, they begin saying, everything you think you know is wrong, okay? And half of them are about my politics, and the other half are about physics. But they also always go like this. Follow this logic, or lack thereof. They say, everyone thinks I'm crazy. Everyone thought Einstein was crazy. Therefore, okay? And then when I read that, I know just press delete. It's really simple, okay? So I can do that. But what they don't understand, and, and, and the real key thing, is they are missing the central part of science. And the central part of science is that scientific revolutions don't do away with everything that went before them. That's what people think. And, and the conventional wisdom is everything we think today, tomorrow is going to be wrong, so why bother learning science? It's just a fad. But that's not the way science works. Because explanations that have survived the test of experiment are true at some level, and they'll never be false. Newton has been supplanted at the extremes of scale by general relativity and quantum mechanics, but to describe the motion of, of uh, cannonballs, I was going to say baseballs, but I guess I have to say cricket balls here. More boring that they do the same thing. Uh, th they, they'll, a, a million years from now, which is probably the length of a cricket match, they, they, <laughs> The laws of, will still be described by Newton, no matter what we learn about the physics at the extremes of scale. What has survived the test of experiment will always be there. So m new modern discoveries don't throw out everything that went before them. And Einstein's greatness was not to, to throw out all the physics before him, but rather to show the two fundamental aspects of modern physics that were both true, namely they both survived the test of experiment, but were inconsistent with each other, couldn't be thrown out because they had survived the test of experiment, and he had to figure out a way to make them consistent. And what were the two things that were inconsistent? Well, the first one is Maxwell's discovery. You measure the strength of the electric force between two charges, the strength of the magnetic force between two magnets, and boom, you calculate the speed of light. Okay? That's Maxwell. But the other thing was a result that's far older, due to Galileo. And Galileo had discovered 400 years earlier that there's no way to tell if you're moving at a constant speed. I mean, all of you have had the experience of, of say, being on a train or maybe a subway, and you're in the car, and then you look across next, and you see the other train moving, and for a second you don't know whether you're moving or they're moving in, in the station until you feel yourself shaking or not shaking. And for that moment, you, it turns out there's no way there's absolutely no way to say which one of you is moving. There's, and what strictly the result is that there's no experiment you can perform on your train that will tell you you're standing still and they're moving. There's no, because every experiment you can do on one train will give you exactly the same result on the other train. So there's no way to know you're moving. I, I, can't, I flew here on a plane at, from Auckland, it turns out, this morning. And in a plane, I could take a ball and throw it up if the windows were closed and there was no turbulence and I wouldn't know that I'm moving. It'd be noisy, but there's no experiment I could perform on that plane that would tell me I was moving. I mean, and we're sitting here at rest, sitting still, depending on how much coffee you had. I just had Diet Coke, so I'm a little jittery. But um, we're not sitting still, okay? We're moving right now around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. And the sun is moving through the galaxy at 200 kilometers per second, so we're really zipping but we feel like we're standing still because there's no way we can say we're moving. It feels like we're standing still. So those are the two fundamental things, basis of modern physics. Galileo and Maxwell. Now, the brilliance of Einstein was to realize those two things are inconsistent. They can't be true at the same time if the world is a sensible place. And he realized that in high school. Okay? That's why he was kind of special. 
So I tried to figure out how to explain this, and I first began to think about this when my daughter was very young. So I, I explain it in terms of projectile vomit, okay? <laughs> so I used to drive her to nursery school, and she didn't like being in the car, and, and now she loves to drive. But so I would drive her, let's say I was driving her at 30 kilometers per hour, very safely, at, to, to school. And, and so I'd be driving her to school, 30 kilometers per hour, and she would, and so let's say she vomited in the back seat, and the projectile vomit hit the back of my head, okay? So, so and the projectile vomit, let's say, is going at 10 kilometers per hour. So I'm in the car driving at 30, 30 kilometers per hour, and the projectile vomit hits me going from the back seat to the front seat at 10 kilometers per hour in the car. Someone on the ground watching, laughing, what would they see? They'd see the car moving away at 30 kilometers per hour, and the projectile vomit going from the back seat to the front seat in the car at 10 kilometers per hour. So relative to them on the ground, the projectile vomit would be moving at 40. Oh, what a wonderful audience. OK, great. I, I, I was at my publishers in London. No, actually, in, in the US. <laughs> And uh, I asked the same question, and no one gave me an answer, because <laughs> they all went to Yale. But anyway, <laughs> which I used to teach at, so I know what that's like. But um, great, OK, that's sensible, 40 kilometers per hour. But now, let's say my daughter's a 21st century child, and she's got a laser, like my laser here. So she shoots a laser the, and hits me in the back of the head from the back seat to the front seat. What happens then? Well, the car is moving at 30 kilometers per hour. The laser beam goes from the back seat to the front seat at a speed of light, OK, in the car. What would someone on the ground see? Well, see the car moving at 30 kilometers per hour, and the laser beam going from the back of the car to the front of the car at the speed of light in the car. So therefore, the person on the ground would see the laser beam moving with respect to them at the speed of light plus 30 kilometers per hour, right? Of course, because you've got it drilled into your head, for instance, you know, that Einstein said no. But Einstein didn't just say no because he decided he'd say no. It's not like, it's not like the Ten Commandments, you know, where he just writes it down and everyone said, OK. He was driven to that because he realized that that sensible result was inconsistent with Galileo and Maxwell. Why? OK. So let's say the person on the ground sees it traveling at the speed of light plus 30 kilometers per hour, OK? That's a problem. Because remember, you calculate the speed of light by measuring the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism in your laboratory, and you get the number for the speed of light. But if the person on the ground looks at that light ray traveling with respect to them, and it's a speed of light plus 30 kilometers per hour, then for them, since the speed of light is determined by the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism, that must mean for them the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism as measured in their laboratory would be different than the person in the car. But Galileo says there's no experiment you can do on the ground that would be different than in the car. So you can't have Maxwell and Galileo be true at the same time. Because it, if that light ray was measured to be traveling at a different speed relative to the two different observers, then you'd be able to know who was moving and who wasn't. And that's not allowed. So what did Einstein do? Did he say, he didn't throw out Maxwell, he didn't throw out Galileo. What he did was say, OK, they both write, so I've got to figure out a way to make them consistent. How can I make them consistent? Well, what is speed? Speed is distance traveled in a certain time. So if they're both, the only way to make it consistent is somehow if both observers measure the light ray traveling with respect to them to have exactly the same speed. The only way that can be consistent is if each observer measures distance and time differently. And those measurements are unique to each observer depending upon what they're doing. Distance and time are relative. And he wrote down the theory of relativity. And, and he said, okay, that's, that's, the only way I can make that consistent. But that's just a story, and that's not science. He said, if that's true, I can make predictions, however. And, what, and there are three predictions that come out of relativity. The first is that lengths contract. If I'm running with respect to you very fast, say this ruler is, or this little projector thing, 
is, say, 10 centimeters long. If I'm running very fast with respect to you, you'll measure it to be four centimeters long, let's say. Now, people think that that's kind of an illusion. You just, you, you have the illusion that it's four centimeters, but it's really 10 centimeters. That's not true. For me, it's 10 centimeters. For you, it is four centimeters, because every measurement you can make tells you it's four centimeters. And what is length other than something you can measure? So it's 10 centimeters and four centimeters at the same time, depending upon who's measuring it. Length has no absolute meaning. It depends on who's observing it. The next implication is that things that are simultaneous for one observer are not simultaneous for another. If lightning strikes either end of this, this auditorium at the same time for us, someone running very fast through the auditorium would see one lightning bolt hit before the other lightning bolt. Okay? And then the final implication, which is the one that drives a lot of science fiction, is that clocks slow down when you're traveling fast. And it's the basis of a lot of good science fiction and a lot of bad science fiction, usually in the same movie. Okay. But it's true. It's not science fiction. We can measure it. We measure it in undergraduate physics laboratories every day. You actually could measure it here today. The fact that you're being bombarded by cosmic rays from the upper atmosphere wouldn't happen if those cosmic rays didn't have clocks that were ticking slowly. It is really true. If I'm traveling fast with respect to you, my clock ticks slowly compared to yours. Those were three predictions that Einstein made. Of course, no, at the time, we, none of them could be measured. But of course, since then, all of them have been measured, and, and they're accurate, and that, because that describes reality. But I prepared your minds for a little bit of this, because this image is exactly the same one I showed you from Plato's cave. And in, in hindsight, it's kind of amazing that it took three years. But Einstein's mathematics professor, three years later, wrote a paper, Herman Minkowski wrote a paper, and in 1908 he said, henceforth space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. What do you mean by that? What he meant was, I can understand this weird phenomena if we don't live in a three-dimensional universe, but we live in a four-dimensional universe. And if space and time are tied together to, to form a four-dimensional space, then basically, when I'm running with respect to you, what I'm seeing is a kind of rotated three-dimensional slice of an underlying four-dimensional space. Just like for the Plato observers, the ruler changed length because it was rotated in this extra dimension. The mathematics is a little more complicated, but basically what Mikowski said is, I can understand this if space and time are tied together in a four-dimensional space. And one person's space is another person's time. And then there is, in this four-dimensional space, there really is a thing called length. We call it space-time length. It's absolute. The theory of relativity really could be called the theory of absolutes. But we perceive the world as three-dimensional, just like those people in the cave perceive the world to be two-dimensional. Because, and why is that? That's because the speed of light is so fast. So we tend to think of things as instantaneous when they're not. For example, if I took a picture of all of you right now, boom, it's an instant, right? It's a, it's a spread out in space, but it's an instant of time. But it's not an instant of time, because the light from the people in the back of the room would have left their heads before the people in the front of the room in order to get to my camera at the time the picture was taken. So I'm really seeing something that's spread out in time as well as space. But because the speed of light is so great, we don't sense that. If, if the speed of light was slower, it would be obvious to us, in a sense. And what happens is when I'm moving with respect to you, I'm kind of seeing a rotated version of reality, of three-dimensional slice that's kind of rotated in, in this four-dimensional space. And you can almost understand it. Look, remember I told you this ruler, if I'm moving with respect to you, gets smaller. Okay? But I said because simultaneity is, goes out the window. For you, something that happens here is not happening at the same time as here. So the ruler is shortened in space but spread out in time. And when you put the two together, its space-time length is exactly the same. And so the mathematician philosopher of the 20th century, Mikowski, showed that really we live in this four-dimensional world 
where space and time are tied together, where two things that are, seem so different, space and time, are rarely confused. They're so different. But they're really different aspects of the same thing. And that was the second great unification in the modern era. And it came from the unification of electricity and magnetism, led to the unification of space and time, and to changing completely our perspective of reality. Okay. Then things, that was really pretty, but things now change. And it, you may recognize this guy, Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman is, um, I wrote a book about him because he was one of the greatest physicists of the second half of the 20th century. But what he and others did was realize, okay, in the time between Maxwell and Einstein and beyond, quantum mechanics had been discovered. And quantum mechanics is weirder than any of the rest of the stuff. Quantum mechanics says that the fundamental scales, the world is crazier than you can imagine. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, I like to say quantum mechanics is like corporate America or Washington, which now are the same thing, but, uh, or probably always were, but um, if, if you can't see it, anything goes, okay? And we're going to learn about that hopefully with investigations in the next little while, but I hope. And so what Feynman and others just tried to do was say, at that, trying to understand a quantum theory of electromagnetism, because classical theory of electromagnetism was described by Maxwell, but on the fundamental scales where quantum mechanics begins to operate, you have to change your understanding of where that electric, electromagnetic force comes from. And Feynman won a Nobel Prize, with several others, for having developed the quantum theory of electromagnetism. We call it quantum electrodynamics. And this is his understanding, as he, he presented, he also thought in pictures, something we call Feynman diagrams, of what the force is, what causes the force between two charges. So here's an electron, and there's another electron, and they repel each other. How does it happen in the quantum world? Well, this electron emits a particle. That particle is the quanta of the electromagnetic field. So even though there's electromagnetic waves in the quantum world, Waves are also particles. And so it emits something called a photon, which is the fundamental quanta of electromagnetism. Okay. But in fact, in the real world, an electron can't do that. Because an electron just sitting there can't emit a bit of light. Because if it did, if the light carries energy, where did the energy come from? The electron was just sitting there. It can't emit light and still be an electron because in the end you'll have more energy than you started with. It violates what we call the conservation of energy. But quantum mechanics is strange. And the manifestation of that thing I told you about cor corporate America is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. And the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle says, if I measure a system for just a little while, I can never know exactly the energy of that system. There's always some uncertainty. No matter what microscopes I have or anything, if I measure it for a certain finite length of time, there's always an inherent uncertainty. And that means that anything goes. Because that means that this electron can emit a photon that carries a little bit of energy. It violates energy conservation, but as long as that photon disappears before I can measure it, it's fine. It's kind of like embezzlement, right? <laughs> I take money out. I gamble on the stock market, as long as I get back in the morning before anyone notices, it's fine. That's exactly what it's like. And that, this theory of electrons emitting photons, and these photons are called virtual photons because you can't see them, because if you could see them, you'd measure the violation of energy conservation. So they're, they're there, but they're not really there. They're there, but you can't see them. And this theory of electrons and virtual photons is the theory of quantum electrodynamics, and it's the best theory in nature. There's no other theory that competes with this. You can make predictions, mathematical predictions, on the basis of this theory and compare them to observation to 14 decimal places, and they agree. There's no other way in all of science where you can do that. This is as good as it gets. Okay? Now there's one other important thing. The electromagnetic force is long range. That means an electron here repels an electron in Alpha Centauri, near a star, okay? or at the other end of the universe. And we now understand that in the quantum world as follows. That's possible because the photon has no mass. Photon has zero mass. 
Because remember, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says if, I, if, I, if the violation of energy conservation is so small that I can't measure it, it's fine. And if I measure a system for a certain amount of time, I can only know the energy to a certain accuracy. And if the photon is massless, then this photon can carry an arbitrarily small amount of energy. And that means it can travel all the way from here to Alpha Centauri, four years, and I still can't measure that energy violation. So because the photon is massless, it can travel a very long time and still not be detected. So we now understand long-range forces in the quantum world are due to the exchange of massless particles. That's everything you need to know. Great. This was the best theory in nature. We have quantum electrodynamics, we have relativity. Everything is great. But then nature intervenes. And we discover it's even weirder. And the first discovery is that the neutron is radioactive. Now this should surprise you. It surprised me when I first learned about it when I was in high school. Because you're made up of neutrons most of the, and protons, but most of the particles in your body are neutrons. There are more neutrons than there are protons in the nuclei of the atoms in your body. If I have a neutron here and I hold it out, it will decay in 10 minutes. Now you will notice, painfully for many of you, that you've been here for longer than 10 minutes. Okay? And you're still here. Some of you wish your neutrons have decayed, probably. But so what, ha what gives? How can we understand that? How's that possible? An accident of nature. So here's a picture of, the, of, of this decay. Here's a, here's a neutron. It decays into three particles, a proton. This weird beta particle is really an electron, and another weirder particle called a neutrino. Now, the, the weird accident of nature is that the neutron and the proton weigh almost exactly the same amount. The neutron is only one part in a thousand heavier than a proton. And that means its mass, the mass of the neutron is just a little bit greater than the sum of the mass of the proton, the mass of an electron, and the mass of a neutrino. If it was less, it couldn't decay. So it can just barely decay into those particles, which is why it lasts 10 minutes, which is a really long time on particle physics scales. Okay? Great. That's, and that's why we call it the weak interaction, because it, 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 it this lives so long. But what happens when I put an, a neutron, when a neutron falls into a nucleus? When a neutron falls into a nucleus, it gets bound. What does it mean to be bound? Some of you know. But what it really means in physics is that if you get bound, it means it takes energy to escape. You lose energy. You know, I'm bound to the Earth, so when, when, I, I, when I fall to the Earth, if I jumped off this stage, I'd lose energy in the process. Okay? So the neutron loses energy when it falls in the nucleus. But Einstein told us E equals mc squared. That means the neutron gets lighter when it loses energy. And when it's inside a nucleus, it's too light to decay into protons plus electrons plus it's neutrinos. It's because the neutron-proton mass difference is so small that just falling into the nucleus makes it too light to decay, and that's why you're here. Because if that accident didn't happen, you wouldn't have, we wouldn't have heavy atoms, have any heavier atoms than hydrogen, basically. There'd be no helium and, and anything beyond. And more importantly, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the stuff that's important for our life is only possible because of this accident of nature. But the weird thing for physicists was this meant there had to be a new force in nature because electromagnetism can't cause that kind of decay. Gravity can't cause that kind of decay. So there had to be a new force. And if there's a new force, we have to understand it. And the first person to try and understand it was this guy here, another one of my favorite physicists, Enrico Fermi. The last great physicist, nuclear physicist and particle physicist, who was equally good at experiment and theory. Now the two fields are so complicated that people do either experiment or theory, but not both. But he did them both. He, he, um, he, was, all, he was the head of, uh, he built the first nuclear reactor built the first controlled chain reaction as part of the Manhattan Project during the Second World War when we were developing a nuclear weapon. And, and he built that, he, he was assigned to build that, which he did. Um, he, uh, it was at the University of Chicago underneath the football field, which I thought was brilliant. Because, you know, if it was an accident, what happens? He killed football players, who cares? Okay, so anyway. Uh, Fermi wrote down the first theory of this interaction. And he submitted it to the journal Nature, who rejected it, which I love, because many, it makes people like me who submit things to Nature and get rejected feel much better to think that that paper got rejected. 
But Fermi didn't take it well. He just said, nope, I'm not going to do theory anymore. I'm going to go do experiments. And it was good for him because a year later he did an experiment and he won Nobel Prize for it two years later. So it worked out. But people built on his theory and, and the idea was, okay, look, the other important thing about physics that people should remember is that it's just like Hollywood. If it works, repeat it. <laughs> Halloween 23 or whatever. And so if you want to make a new force, why not copy a force that works? So here's a picture of the best theory in nature. So why not try and make a picture that looks the same for this new force? So I can draw a picture, find what's called a Fermi diagram, and it looks more or less the same. The neutron changes into a proton. It's made of quarks, but that doesn't matter. It's made of particles. And then there's an exchange of a particle, and it turns into an electron and a neutrino. It looks kind of like this picture. Great. Now, there's a difference between these forces. Electromagnetism works across the universe. The nuclear force works only on the sides of the nucleus. The weak force only works on the sides of the nucleus. Very different. But I can explain that. How? Let's make this particle very massive. If it's very massive, then when it gets emitted, it carries a lot of energy. But if it carries a lot of energy, it can't exist for very long if it's a virtual particle, or I'd be able to measure it, the violation of energy. So it has to, it has to it can only travel a very short distance before it has to decay or turn into other things. And that means the force will be short range. So if the particle that mediates this force is massive, this was massive, then I explain why these forces are so different. Great! There's a problem. This is the best theory in nature and this one is nonsense. Because when you try and do mathematical calculations with this picture, you come up with infinities. Physicists don't like infinities. Mathematicians love them. But, you know, if infinite things can't, don't lead to any predictions. This was a problem. This was a problem recognized in the 1960s, and it was such a severe problem, it's amazing to think about this, that physicists were willing to give up all the beautiful aspects of quantum mechanics and relativity that explained electromagnetism. They said maybe on the, on the level of nuclei, those laws don't work anymore. It's really kind of fascinating. And, and one of the things that I liked about writing the book I did is that they, you realize in the history of physics that this is a secret, but physicists are human. And that means they're pig-headed, and they have false ideas, and they don't want to give them up. But what's great is that the science overcomes those biases and prejudices. And so there are times in writing the book, and maybe when you read it, that you know, I just want to shake these people and say, the answer is right over here. You already have it. Why, why are you going in that direction. But eventually the science gets them, drags them, kicking and screaming in the right direction. And so physicists actually gave up all these beautiful pictures for a long time, the 1960s, but the answer was staring them in the face. And it came from another area of physics, superconductivity. In 1911, I think it was, uh, a Dutch physicist named Kamerling Onnes discovered when you cool mercury down to four degrees above absolute zero, something really strange happens. The resistance goes to zero. The electrical resistance goes to zero. Not very small, but precisely zero. What does that mean? It means if I have a wire of mercury, let's cool down, it's a form of wire, and I hook it up to a battery and I get a current starting to flow, and I cool it down to below four degrees, I take the battery away, the current will continue to flow. And it won't flow for just a day or a week. It'll flow forever. It will never, ever stop. Because the electrical resistance is precisely zero. It's remarkable. And on is called it superconductivity. He was a good name. He was good at work for an advertising agency. It is amazing. It is one of the most amazing phenomena in nature. And it, 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 it took about 50 years to understand it, the complex interaction of electrons in, in materials allowed this to happen. Okay, now what's that this got to do with anything? Well, now of course we can make superconductors that are actually superconducting at a much higher temperature, say dry ice, and then we can do neat experiments in high school physics classes. And this is one experiment. You put a superconductor in dry ice, and then you put a magnet near it, and the magnet floats. Why is that? Because it turns out magnetic fields can't permeate a superconductor. They get to the superconductor and they die off at the surface. 
And, and so if you want to think about it, the field lines get repelled at a superconductor, and that repulsion lifts up the magnet and it levitates. Great, it's a neat little experiment to do in high school, looks neat. Again, what's this got to do with anything? Well, now I want you to think about this. Imagine you live in this superconductor. What would the world look like to you if you lived in that superconductor? Well, for you, electricity and magnetism would be short-range forces because magnetic fields die off in a very short distance in the superconductor. And the same is true for electric fields, if I put an electric charge there. So for you, if you were a physicist growing up in that, in, in, that, in that superconductor, you would derive laws of physics for electromagnetism and quantum laws of physics for electromagnetism. And for you, the photon would be massive. And in fact, the photon is massive inside a superconductor. Photons, which are massless here, when they go inside a superconductor, behave as if they're massive particles. And that was the key that was there, but it wasn't seen, because now it allows us to solve a problem. The way I like to think about it is imagine you're swimming in a pool. You swim in a pool, you feel fairly light, you're moving, you know, there are buoyant forces, and you feel fairly light. But let's say I fill up the pool with molasses, and you sw swim in that. Well, most of you wouldn't want to swim in it in the first place, kind of yucky. But let's say you did go. What would happen? You would, it'd be a lot harder to swim. You'd feel a lot heavier because you'd experience a resistance. Okay? Now imagine that there's an invisible field everywhere in the universe Everywhere in the universe, you can't see it. But particles, some particles interact with that field and they experience a resistance. It slows them down. Imagine, in fact, that we live in a cosmic superconductor of sorts. And if that's the case, then we can solve this problem. Because now I can sort of draw these pictures in a slightly different way. This, this is the same picture I drew earlier, just turned sideways with the electromagnetic interaction. And these are the interactions that produce the, the, the decay of a, of, a, of a neutron into electron and neutrino. But now let's imagine that these particles that transmit the weak force, the so-called W and Z particles, if you're here, W and Z particles if you're in the States, imagine that they're masses too, just like the photon. But these particles interact with this background field that's everywhere, and they act as if they're massive, just like a photon does in a superconductor. Then for us, those particles will act like they're massive, and the force that they mediate will be short range. But at a fundamental level, they're exactly the same as this. And the mathematics is exactly the same, which means, by the way, that it produces sensible results, not crazy infinities. And this theory does produce sensible results. But even better, the mathematics is not only so much the same that we now understand that these are exactly the same force. The electromagnetic force and this weird weak force are just two different manifestations of precisely the same thing. And the only reason they look different is because of this accident of our existence. That there's this invisible field everywhere in nature and the W particles interact with it and they act like they have mass. So the central feature of our existence that these two forces, each of which individually is responsible for our existence, and the world the way it is, is an accident. It's an accident because there's this invisible field everywhere in nature. Now up to this point, it sounds religious. I mean, just think what I said. There's an invisible field everywhere, <laughs> and it's responsible for you being here, okay? But this isn't religion, this is science. And that means you can't just say that and go home. Or even if you repeat it every Sunday, it doesn't, make, it doesn't do anything. If the field is there, we have to measure it. How can you measure it? It's an extraordinary claim. In science, of course, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence to be supported. Where can you get that evidence? And the answer is cosmic sadomasochism. Spank the vacuum. Spank it hard! <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, in the quantum world, every field, like the electric field, is associated with a particle. And if I can somehow dump enough energy in a single point, then maybe 
if there's this background field, I'll kick out real particles associated with that field. So let me call that field the Higgs field. And if I can somehow put together enough energy and dump it into a single point, maybe I can kick out real particles. Let's call them Higgs particles. So I have to figure out a way to dump a lot of energy into a single very small point. How do I do that? I build the most complicated machine humans have ever built. This, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. This is a machine which is a, which is a particle accelerator and it's in Geneva and this, this is, uh, if you can't see it very well here, but there's Lake Geneva there and if you land at the airport right here, you look out, you see farmland and just beautiful stuff. But 100 meters under the farmland is a tunnel that's 26 kilometers around and we accelerate protons at 99.9999998% the speed of light in that direction. We accelerate other protons at 99.9999998% the speed of light in that direction. And we collide them at a few single points, focusing them, hoping they'll dump enough energy to create Higgs particles. And they go around thousands of times every second. Here's the French-Swiss border right there. They go through the border thousands of times every second without passports, okay? And Donald Trump wants to change that, but that's okay. <laughs> and what happened? Well, in, in the United States, there's an anachronistic holiday uh, that, that me, July 4th, it means something to people in the United States, but now it has a cosmic significance. Because on July 4th, 2012, the Large Hadron Collider experiments announced they discovered 50 particles, and the particles kind of walked like a Higgs particle, quacked like a Higgs particle, and therefore they were probably Higgs particles. And in the intervening five years, the experiments have been performed and we've discovered a lot more of these particles and they have exactly the properties that were predicted if there's an invisible field responsible for our existence. The Higgs particle meant, the discovery of that meant that there really is an invisible field everywhere in the universe. And we live in a kind of cosmic superconductor. It's amazing. That story is an amazing story. In fact, it's the greatest story ever told so far. But the reason it's the greatest story, and this may relate to things that Charlie and I'll talk later, is that in my opinion, this is the humanity at its best. Because you've got people, the physicists didn't want to get this picture, they were dragged to that picture. The idea is to go where nature tells you and bravely follow the experiments, even if it means the universe is not the universe we'd like to live in. And then be willing to go and build from that and build, have people spend 50 years building the most complicated machine that's ever been built just to test that idea. One of the, I was going to say unfortunate, it's not really unfortunate, but one of the slightly unfortunate aspects of science is it produces technology. Now, of course, it's great. We wouldn't be here. Most of us wouldn't be alive if it weren't for technology. But nowadays, people say, you know, when you talk about these things, what good is it? Does it make a better toaster or a faster car? And the point is, that's not the, what science is, makes science so important, in my mind. The technology obviously is useful. It's the ideas. Because science, like art, music, and literature, the real beauty of it is, is it changes our perspective of our place in the cosmos, like a good play, like a good Picasso painting. Like a good novel, like a good piece of art. All of them contribute to our culture. And it is amazing that we are willing to build these machines, which I think, I, I argue, are like the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. The Gothic cathedrals were built over centuries by thousands of artisans who came together to, to, and, and, and used the most sophisticated technology of the time to try and build these things. The Large Hadron Collider was built by 10,000 physicists over 20 years from over 100 different countries, speaking dozens of different languages, many different religions, all coming together to work together for a single purpose. Science brings people together. Religion divides them, but science brings people together. And the machines are amazing. This is, this is not the machine. This is just a detector in this machine. This is one of the larger detectors. There's a person that's called the Atlas detector. There's a smaller detector called the compact muon solenoid, which is small. It has the amount of iron as the Eiffel Tower, same amount of iron as the Eiffel Tower. And it's, if you go there, you feel like Gulliver. And it's really amazing. I have a better picture, because I'm in it. There I, it's, it, it, these machines are absolutely amazing. 
And you can't say enough. There's a whole chapter in my book about the Large Hadron Collider because it is so amazing. And just to give you a sense of it, every second at the Large Hadron Collider, enough data is generated to fill more than a thousand one terabyte hard drives. That's more than the information in all the world's libraries, every second. And the 26 kilometers around has to be evacuated to, with a vacuum that's sparser than the vacuum of space outside the International Space Station. Everything about this machine is amazing. And it was all built to try and understand why we're here. But the neatest part about all this is that we're not done. And, and I happen to like art, so I like Impressionist art. And the thing I love about Impressionist art is that it looks great when you're far away, but you get close, it looks really crappy. Okay? Because that's what physics is like. Because we, we have this theory now called the standard model that explains every experiment we can perform to incredible accuracy. But there are questions that it raises. Like, why did this Higgs field freeze in the way it did in the early history of the universe? So we're here. Why did that happen? Why did it happen to the scale it happened? Why did it freeze in a certain way? We don't know. Which is the greatest part of science, which is why the best part of the title of the new book is, is the so far part. Because the greatest story ever told so far gets better every day because every day we make new discoveries. And unlike that other greatest story ever told, which was static and has been the same for 2,000 years since the peasants who wrote it down thought the, who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun, that story is still the same. But ours gets better all the time because nature, not people's imaginations, but nature forces us in new directions. So you said I could ask you anything. Anything you want. So I warn you that later on I'm going to ask you about alien superstructures. Oh, OK. Just, just park that idea. OK, great. But, but first off, talking about the book, The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, why this book now? Ah, oh, it's a good question. Um, two reasons, I think, or maybe even more. One was I wrote a book called Universe of Nothing, which was about the revolutions that took place in our understanding of the universe on larger scales. And it tried to take back a question that was usurped by religion. Why is there something rather than nothing? Which is really a scientific question, not a religious question. And I wanted to show how science had changed the meaning of that question. But at the same time, really talk about the fact that our picture of the universe on the larger scales had completely changed. And I thought, well, what better way to follow it up than talk about how our picture of the universe on the small scales has changed, and really talk about unheralded discoveries in physics in the last 50 years that really weren't understood well. And you know, mo when people look at the history of science, and the, many people think, oh, the 19, in the 20th century, between 1905 and 1925 with the relativity and quantum mechanics, that was the big revolutionary era. But actually, 20 years between 1955 and 1975, I think in the far future, will be seen as the most revolutionary era, when almost all of this was discovered. And then attack another question that, you, that religion usurps, which is, why are we here? And so it seemed a natural thing to do. And then I finished it around the time of the presidential election, and uh, which in the United States takes two years. And and maybe we'll get to it, but I thought it had implications. I thought, I thought the, the story there, which is the best of humanity, could be compared to the worst of humanity, which is what we were saw, seeing and what we continue to see. That yeah. story unfolds on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's, it, it's the worst story ever told so far, and it gets worse every... <laughs> every, every and we will, we'll touch on that shortly, but um, I think there's a little more at play with this book. You, you begin many of the chapters with Bible verses, and I don't think that's just because you looked them up in a good dictionary of quotations. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, and, and it's amazing how many people have objected to that. I, and there's also a structure of the book. It's three sections, Genesis, Exodus, and Revelation. And, and people were really offended by that, which I suppose is something I was happy about. But, <laughs> but how can you be offended? I mean, it's just, you know, I, what I wanted to do was compare the real story of the real universe to a story that many people have said was the greatest story ever told. And the Bible is full of good quotes. I mean, it, almost anything you want to talk about, you can find a quote in the Bible, because it is literature. A lot of it's pretty crappy literature, but there's some beautiful literature in the Bible. And, and so... You can't argue with the, with the book sales. 
Yeah, exactly. It's no, like Dan well, Brown, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, but the, it's the, only so good, but it shifts units. Yeah, know. no, but the difference with the Bible is they don't sell it; they give it away. It's like yeah. it's kind of like heroin, <laughs> you know. They give it away first to the little kids, and then they, then they, yeah, anyway. Okay. But you um, because the stories in this book, I feel like you are telling the stories of the saints. Of your, your, See, of your I'm, belief. I'm, I'm, I, I use belief in, in a jesting fashion. But yeah, because there are no beliefs. And, and I, I wonder if you're, if you're angling for your own beatification as part of the process. <laughs> but, but do you, no. see, do you see these stories as, as deserving of that level of... Well, I think, that's, I think it's an epic, but more, more in the sense of the really good stories. I think it compares to the Aeneid and the Odyssey. Not, and because I didn't write it, but... In the, in the scope of understanding the breadth of, you know, those stories were, were understanding the, 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 their existence at the time, but also human foibles and, 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 and drama and mistakes and the consequences of those mistakes. So I, I do think it has epic grandeur, and, and, and I think um, it's not hyperbole to say that. So, yeah, it's because it's, it's, I don't think the Bible is such a great story, and by the way, we don't want, I don't want to be sainted at all. And, and more important, I mean, I think I was on, I can't remember, I think it was in, in Australia. Richard Dawkins and I were at the Sydney Opera House, and uh, someone asked after we talked, you know, what, can you, what do you do to help make people follow you? And we, and we both said the same thing. We don't, I don't want anyone to follow me. I mean, especially when I'm walking somewhere. But <laughs> what we wanted people to think. I don't, care, I don't want people to follow me. I mean, I, I certainly hope I don't. I want people to just think and ask questions. And, and that's what I hope the greatest story does, is really you start to ask questions because every time you make new discoveries, there are more questions. I, I feel like it's appropriate that, we're, that you are here and, and we're having this conversation, I, I said to you before we came mm -hmm. on, in the Collingwood Town Hall, and I say I love town halls like this. I've done a lot of very flip, frivolous talking, doing stand-up comedy in town halls like this all across the country. But I love them because they are centres of culture within communities and buildings like this I believe harken back to a time when governments spent money on that sort of thing and they, and they saw that as an investment and in it, culture. And it was what made, you know, what in principle made Australia better, right? It made Australia a place that you want to be in. It wasn't just a bunch of, you know, shacks, okay, and, and coal mines and, and other things and, and, and unlike the country which is, well, I'll talk about it, I think on q and I mean, Instead of building new town halls, they're spending a billion dollars on some big, huge coal mine. And, and, it, and 100 years so from retro, now... Which is so retro, isn't it? It's so retro, and it's worse. 100 years from now, that's not what's going to make Australia be, be venerated in any way in the rest of the world. But you're right. These, these, this is what makes life worth living. And, and uh, these kind of town halls, the kind of culture, and that's the tradition, if anything, that if you're Australian, you'd think you'd want to save. Um, the first philosophy subject I did at university was called Science, Religion, and Witchcraft. Ah. And it, it, it delved largely into the unscientific examinations of witchcraft on behalf of religion, you know, ah. and, and then extrapolated from there the attitudes towards science. But I think it's quite funny because this week um, Donald Trump said that he is the subject of the greatest witch, witch hunt, hunt of all time. time. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny, there's another political story. A friend of mine who's actually... Australian, although he's originally British, he's, he works at my university, Paul Davies, um, who, for the public, sounds like a guy who, who likes religion, and we have our discussions there. But he wanted me to write a piece because he didn't want to blow his brand. Um, but there was a woman running for uh, Senate in the United States, and, and she was vilified because it turned out she was a witch. She, she'd been a member of, you know, whatever, you know, she'd been a witch or stud in, that, in that religion, which was, which was a religion. And he wanted me to write a piece because he agreed that, you know, in fact, if you think about it, actually, it's much more sensible than Christianity. So she shouldn't be vilified because, in fact... I can't it, imagine it, how that would blow it, his yeah, brain. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Well, no, yeah, so I didn't write the piece, <laughs> but I said I'd only write it if he put his name on it, too, and he didn't want to do it. But it is true. If you think about it, witchcraft is actually much more, it makes much more sense in many ways than, than at least... That kind of, because it, it is much less deification than, than, than all the ridiculous stories of Christianity or Judaism or Islam. They're all equal. I was on a program at, at this 
Al Jazeera, you know, I, I did this, and, and I was amazed that they didn't edit it because I was having a debate about, I think, atheism versus Islam. And, um, and I said, you know, Islam isn't any worse than the other religions. They're all equally crazy. And, and, and I was amazed, not only that it got on, but I, there was no fatwa against me afterwards. <laughs> But um, Donald Trump, who is obviously the subject of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, he made me wonder, who is more persecuted now, Donald Trump or scientists? Well, do I don't think, think science... Well, scientists feel persecuted because, indeed, they're, they're, <laughs> the, the science is being persecuted in the sense that it's being ostracized. It's being removed from the public arena. And that's, that's, that's bad for everyone uh, because... It, the empirical evidence should be the basis of public policy. And so it always amazes me that people, <laughs> I, I just, I think I did a tweet or I wrote a piece, I can't remember, I think it was a tweet recently where I was amazed because um, this, oh, it was, it, was a, it was the son of Billy Graham, who's this big evangelist in the United States. His name is Franklin Graham. And he, he was on TV saying that, you know, Christians were being persecuted because they were, there were legal proceedings against them when they refused to serve gays. Now think about that. They're being persecuted because they're not even allowed to persecute others. I mean, and that's the, that's the Donald Trump mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, oh. We're being, oh, we're being censored. No, oh, is I'm your wondering. phone, your phone, re okay, okay. Oh, excellent, I like that. See, that, that may have done nothing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, I think you're, oh, you're better equipped to fix yeah. it than I am. Yeah. It's because electromagnetism is a long-range force. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just give yeah. you one second. I'll um, just... Uh... Okay. Actually, turning it off is effective. I oh, think. well. <laughs> I, it shows how little I was listening to my lecture <laughs> in the previous, <laughs> previous comment. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel... You participated in the science march. Yeah, I, I did. But, I, but not in Washington. I wouldn't do it in Washington, no. I, I, I was in North Carolina, which is a red state, and I was happy to be there for, partly for that reason. But I, I was frankly, I'm, I think in Australia it was less, it was more, I was all in favor of a march for science. First of all, if it was an, I didn't want it to be a march by scientists. That's useless. I think, because then they just appear to be a lobbying group. You know, we want to be people to care for us, you know. Um, I wanted to be the public to saying we care about science because we want the results of science to help make the world a better place, not a worse place. But also, and, and this is very politically incorrect, but I don't give a damn. Um, it was a march about science. It wasn't a march about diversity and feminism, and there, all those things are important. But I, I felt it, was, it diluted the message. If, and in Washington, that was happening. People were saying you know, science is responsible for for ostracizing minorities and all of these other things. And, and it's true that, you know, that, that we need more diversity in science, but that wasn't what I thought was worth marching for. It was, it was at this time responding to a government that doesn't accept the evidence of climate change, for example, and is going to negatively impact on the future of not just everyone here, but the children of everyone here and the children, children of everyone here. And that's the thing that we needed to protest. And that's why I wanted it focused on that. And so I was happy to be, a lot of the local marches were focused on that. And I, I don't know if it was the case here, but, but the Washington one was just wrapped up too much in other issues for me. Um, do you feel that science bears an undue burden of prediction? It, 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 it feels that science is the best tool that we have developed to explain the universe. Yeah. But often the argument, the political argument that comes against science is, well, climate scientist A, you said it would be this many degrees hotter and it's not, therefore you're yeah. wrong. Or well, there, there is too much burden on science to make perfect predictions. Well, perfect predictions is a misunderstanding of science because the great virtue of science, and I've written about this somewhere, is that it, the greatest aspect of science is uncertainty because it's the only area of human activity where we can actually quantify uncertainty. Because nothing is certain. Every result, everything you measure has uncertainty. Everything you predict has uncertainty. But the great thing about science is we can say, here's a result, but we know with high probability that the actual number will be between here and there. And some people think that's a weakness. The fact that we can say, well, the temperature you know, of the Earth is going to change by two or three degrees Celsius 
That's not, maybe it's me this time. Oh, no. you've got a phone. Yeah. I don't think I'm it is. I'm throwing mine downstairs. Yeah, I know, I know, back. I know, I know. <laughs> um, I have two. So. <laughs> I've got an American one and an Australian one. Um, but so, so you're right, people often point out that scientists don't want to say things with certainty as if it's a weakness of science. And, and, and what we really need to teach people is the nature of science. And, and, and I, I've argued, and I, maybe we can talk about the fact that, to me, part of the failure of democracy is really a failure of explaining what science is. Because a healthy democracy needs an informed electorate to make decisions about the people that are going to be elected and those people who are elected to be informed by empirical evidence. And the fact that we teach science as if it's just a collection of facts, and then you can have these alternative facts, is wrong, because science is not. We got, when I was going to school, that's what you went to school. You just learned these facts. And, this fact, this fact, and you memorize it and you get past and all that. And science is a process for deriving facts, to take the difference between sense and nonsense. And we don't teach that process. There are more facts in this phone as well as more misfacts. And what we need to do for the next generation, because it's too late for all of you, <laughs> uh, we, we need to teach the next generation because what's going to make them responsible adults who are appropriate to be voting is, is they need to learn to tell the difference between the facts and the crap on this phone. And that means teaching them the process of science, the skeptical inquiry, reliance on empirical evidence, constant testing. And so I think that story of the greatest story ever told has application because if we can cut through the crap of the real universe, we can cut through the crap of Donald Trump. The the interesting thing about when you say cutting through the crap of Donald Trump, let's, yeah. let's not be specific about him, but let's talk about politics because yeah. politics runs the show. Yeah, yeah. And the uncertainty of the universe and the uncertainty of science uh -huh. does not work well in the marketplace of politics, which is a marketplace of certainty. Yeah. I know that tough laws will end crime. I know that a, a more funding of the military will make us safer. That that surety that politicians have, despite the fact, sweet Lord, we know they're all wrong all the time. time. There's never been a politician that left politics and everyone said, geez, he got it all wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, Yet but they are perfectly certain, and in the marketplace, uncertainty struggles to compete. It's, that's really an important point. It's a, it's a really brilliant point, because you can't be successful as a politician and say, I don't know, first of all. Or, you know, we're going to try this and see if it works, but maybe we, we don't know. But that's the way it should be. And, and, you do, know, you but it's not do you feel Barack Obama tried to do that a little? He a tried to actually be thoughtful enough to say, he was, well, we're not, you know. Well, yes and no. I mean, he's a politician, and so he <laughs> did something. No, really, and I, I say that. I, I was on his, I was one of his science advisors in the first election. He put together a science advisory committee when he's running for president, and I'm very, very proud to be part of that. I never joined the administration after that, and there are many problems I had with that administration, but he was certainly more, he qualified things because he actually thought about them. I mean, it's easy to make definitive statements like Donald Trump does if you've never thought about it. If you actually think about it, you realize the nuance. But it's not just politicians, and I think your, while your point is brilliant, it goes beyond that. It, the currency of uncertainty doesn't work in politics, but it doesn't work for teachers or for parents. You, I, you have a, a brilliant two and a half year old we were talking about. And I hope that, you're, that you are happy. That's yours again. Is it? Microphone isn't doing anything. No, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's OK. I think that we'll, we'll see. It, uh, OK, anyway, <laughs> the, the, so, so my, when, he, my... when, he, when he asked you a question, I mean, all parents want to say, give the answers, right? Because you want to be the big authority figure. But it'd be be it's better if you say, especially if you don't know, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's see what the, what the answer is. Let's, so the process becomes a process of discovery instead of being told the answer. I am listening, clearly. Yeah, yeah OK. And, uh, and, and so it, it, it would be better if politicians said, you know, let's, let's work. Let's see what happens. And, and, if, and, and, you know, entrepreneurs know this, that failing is an important part of progress. Anyway, but you're, but you're right, that that's why they hit scientists. And they also say that, you know, they also think it's democratic. Look, maybe it is me. I don't know what to know. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I have this turned off, but let me just, but uh, um, that, that, 
So I think I just will do this quickly, Lawrence. If you take that microphone, uh -huh. just being handed to you oh, over okay. your. Okay, but I'm turning no, this off. I want to. I, I want to make sure they're both turned off because I I trust the science more than 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 that. Let me just make sure we can do an experiment at least. Now we know if 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 they do anything, it can't be because they're turned on. So we'll okay. try that microphone now. Okay. Okay. And see if that's not. Um, anyway, um, so. I can definitely hear you now. Oh, excellent. Okay, you want to start over? <laughs> no, anyway. Um, but uh, your your hope your hope for say my 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 child, which I have yeah, a vested and, interest in. And, and, but and and for the public, is that is that politicians be willing to to say we're going to try something and and but it also happens and the part of the thing against climate change is not just saying well you can't predict it exactly. Therefore, that's the other thing. Can't predict it exactly. Therefore, it's got to be totally wrong. And, and it's the same in religion. I, I, I've quoted, I've seen this on T-shirts, a quote I said, which is that lack of understanding is not evidence for God. It's evidence of lack of understanding. And, and, and it's okay to say, you know, the climate, our models are this good and they're going to get better, uh, but they're not certain. And, and, and people use that to argue, well, not everyone, there's some disagreement about the actual number. And you can always find a scientist. That's the other thing. Journalists are the real problem, partly, okay? No, uh, because journalists, and you, I know that you were actually trained as a lawyer. Did you know that about him? He was a lawyer. I, was, it, it, I do nothing it, to give that impression. It, 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 I'm sorry, okay. But, but with the, the journalists are trained that there's sort of two sides to every story. So they always, the, the great thing about science is one side is wrong. <laughs> and, and so they always find, if you can always find a PhD to say anything. You can find a PhD to say the earth is flat, you can find a PhD say climate change isn't happening. So if you write a story and you, you can always find that person, then the public says, oh, well, there's a controversy. It's 50-50. When it shouldn't be done, done that way, because that's not the way it is. Anyway, I'm going on too no, long. No, I work at an organization with enforced editorial balance, and yeah, we're onto that. Um, <laughs> so what, what I would say, though, about being wrong, uh, in, in the book you wrote about, about one, of your, one of the characteristics of Newton that you refer to is, is his... His sense of competition with his peers, yeah, and his absolute belief that he was right and they were wrong. Yeah, he was a cr crazy man. Yeah, but I'm just curious, who of your peers are you sure are absolutely wrong, and you're right? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to list that. Um, <laughs> but no, but what, but what, what I will say is that. Um, Part of the misunderstanding of science is, you know, that we have this sort of unwritten agreement to agree that, you know, the reason uh, the scientists believe in evolution because they're all liberal atheists and that we somehow have this secret handshake and we go in every day at work and we, but they don't realize that the way to become famous as a scientist is to prove your colleagues wrong. That you, you, go, you go into work every day and one of the things you're trying to do is prove everyone else to be wrong. Because that's the way you make a, that's the way you make a you know a big name in science. So, and being wrong is is for me. I've often said that for if you're a theoretical physicist at least, the two best states to be in are wrong or confused, because it means there's something to learn. So, it's really important if you're working on something. You know, so there is an element of faith in science, namely if you're going to spend 20 years on a theory, you've got to have a a real reason to think it's right. You may call that faith. So there is faith. But the great thing about the faith in science is, is it's shakeable. Because you work for 20 years on a theory, and then you discover it doesn't work. And you throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. That's the great thing. So of course you need that confidence that you're right, and the other people are wrong, until you discover you're wrong. And that, that questioning of yourself is really important. Feynman said the easiest person to fool is yourself. Because we all want to believe. We all want to believe that what happens to us is significant. And so to question yourself is something you learn to be trained, I think, is one of the greatest trainings of science. Yeah, okay. I'm being too serious, but that's okay. No, no but it's fascinating. Speaking of belief, I, I noticed I, I was looking at the, um, uh, the website for the Origins Project, uh. and I noticed that you are taking a trip uh, to Machu Picchu yes. with Richard Dawkins. Yes. Uh, and the dates of the trip are December 23rd to 28th. Yes which I can only imagine was done to deliberately antagonize. <laughs> but I wondered what fascinates you about Machu Picchu? 
Oh, interesting. Okay. First of all, by the way, it is true. Well, part of it was determined because Richard did not want to be in England during Christmas. That's true. <laughs> right. And and, and not just it, because of Love Actually reruns. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I, I think there's a new, ver someone just said there's a new, ver new movie. They no, are making a new, yeah. a new one. Um, I actually like the movie, so it's okay. But um, uh, I like Bill Nye a lot. Uh, he's and, wonderful. Yeah, anyway, he's um, great. Uh, but actually there's another more practical reason. We're actually going on a, we're also leading a cruise up the Amazon, and that's happening December 29th to, or December 30th to January 7th. Wow. So we wanted... And the real Are you Amazon ready? Are you, have you prepared for this? The not Amazon yet, but it's almost been, killed Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, I know. No, I, not yet, but it's a long time between now and then. So <laughs> I, I hope, to be, hope to learn something about it. It's going to be really exciting. And, I'm, and, and so um, and par, I mean, it's just practical also. It turns out when we announced that cruise, it sold out in an hour. I was kind of surprised. And, and, and we have this boat. And it was scary because I booked the whole boat. And uh, it was terrifying, and then it's all, and I felt badly, so we thought maybe we could add a land trip that wouldn't be as constrained, and people, that would also be a little cheaper, because it's pretty expensive. And so we said, let's, let's add a place. And Machu Picchu is an amazing part of human history. It's an amazing example of a civilization that's, that's lost. And, and that represents, I mean, that's the, when it comes to the universe or human, humanity, everyone always thinks that the present is the way things are always going to be. Hmm. And Americans in particular think the United States is the most powerful country in the world. It's the way it's always going to be. And it's not the way, I mean, hopefully it's not the way it's always going to be. And the United States is doing everything possible right now to make sure it isn't that way. <laughs> Literally, it's ceding Asia to, uh, uh, and this part of the world to China. And, and so it's, I think, very illuminating. I used to do history, as I think I told you. Mm. And, and it's really illuminating to me to see amazing civilizations, yet how, they, the, the, how things have changed. Because... This too shall pass. Um, you talk about, you, you mentioned Alan Alda in, mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. book, um, and a great comment that he made that, oh, yeah. I, and I've, I've written it down, that art requires hard work and science requires, uh, re requires creativity. And I, I wondered, first of all, how did you two come to be friends? Because I've, I've not met, met anyone more passionate about science than, than Alan uh -huh. Alda. Yeah. yeah. And I wondered how you met. Well, we first met, I think, because we were um, on a panel, I think, um, at, a, at a scientific meeting, because he was attending it, and, and we started to talk. And over the years, we interacted a variety of times in different venues, and then started to do a few things together. Um, and, you know, he's, he is passionate about science and also really knowledgeable and really thoughtful. And, he, and he's working now. He has a program to try and teach scientists how to communicate better involves teaching him improv, by the way. And, and, uh, and so we've talked a lot about science communication. But that statement of his was brilliant. Actually, the actual statement, which he reminded me after the book came out, is that um, art requires precision. Science requires creativity. And what's wonderful about it, of course, is the exact opposite of what, of pe what people normally think. Of course, they both require both. But everyone thinks that creativity is only in the domain of the arts. And, and science has just got no creativity. And so it was so wonderful for him, a cultural icon, to say that about science. I think it's really important that people like you and people who are part of popular culture and recognized ind indicate their interest in science and the importance of science in, in what they're talking about. Because it's easy for someone like me who's a scientist to say, gee, science is important. But it's great for icons like you I, I prefer <laughs> living national treasures, but sure, that's, that's absolutely fine. Anyway. <laughs> well, I, I think a, 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 the a thing that I share with, um, with Alan, and, and having heard you speak tonight with, with you, is I, I'm passionate about the story of science. I, I, do, I do believe it is a story that is handed on genuinely from generation to generation, if it is taken care of. And, and, it, if it's and taken curated. care of, and, and each generation makes it better. Mm. They don't just take the story and repeat it. They, they change it, and that's, it's part and of the I, human story. And, and I loved the, uh, the, the point, th this isn't just about me telling you I had fun tonight, but yeah. I, I loved the point that you made that you don't throw out everything we've learned so far yeah. just because you learned something new, whereas I think the world feels like it that, o operates opposite to that. That's why people can be climate changed in ours so well. That's part of the propaganda. They say, oh, of course the current fad is climate change, but next month 
the fat will be something else. Part or, of the, or viewing vaccination as, yeah. oh, that, that was really important when we had polio, but now we don't, so yeah, exactly. therefore it's not important. And part of the problem is medicine also, because it's hard. I mean, I tell people that the reason I do physics is because it's easy, and it is compared to uh, understanding the brain, say, for example. And, and the other reason it's easy is we can do, we can have 500 billion collisions at the Large Hadron Collider, but in a medical, large-scale medical epidemiological study, there may be 20 patients. Yeah. And so it's a lot harder to make definitive statements, and that's why actually science, our medicine does tend to change and, and was more fat like and people tend to think it, it, it that is a characteristic of science but it's not and but that's the reason people can get away with saying oh tomorrow next month they'll say climate change didn't happen so we are out of time I, but being at the end i want to i want to ask a question about the end okay and then we're going to ask have some audience yeah, questions absolutely oh, good. audience okay. questions quickly how close have we come to ending human existence Okay, you know I, I'm... As a, I, as a marshal of the, the doomsday clock. Yeah, yeah I... But I, I don't I, necessarily mean right now, but also in our, you know, in our lifetime, in our, in our recent history, in our experience. Well, you know, I just was in Auckland talking about that because I, I, I am chairman of the board of the Bolton Atomic Scientists. We set the doomsday clock and I announce it every year. Um, and it, we have a symposium, which I get to run, or I get to attend, called the Doomsday Symposium. It's a lot of fun every year <laughs> trying, uh, to think about the ways we can kill ourselves. I don't know how close. Uh, I think we, it's amazing that we're still here in many ways because uh, as Einstein said when the first nuclear weapon was exploded, everything's changed save the way we think. And nothing's changed mm. about the way we think, but it has to because we can destroy ourselves. And most of people in the world are quite complacent about nuclear weapons when they shouldn't be. They say, well, it's 70 years, we haven't had an explosion. But I'm, I don't make predictions about the future uh, unless it's two trillion years in the future. Um, <laughs> But, but I would bet money that there'll be a, a use of a nuclear weapon against a civilian population in this century. And, um, and that's tragic, but, but in order to, for that not to happen, the public has to care. And the virtue of the doomsday clock is not whether it's accurate at two and a half minutes to midnight, which it is now, which is the closest it's been in 65 years. You can argue about that. But what it does do, and I think it's what I like to do as a scientist, is it for one day of the year, it raises the public's awareness of all of the existential threats because if we're going to deal with, if we're going to survive, we have to at least recognize them and not bury our heads in the sand. We have to face the future for what it really will be. And Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. And so the ver as, a, as an educator, if I, if I, I try to get people to be prepared for the future. And, and that's why it's you have to think about the things you don't like if you want to avoid them. Ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence, uh, will be signing copies of the book up the back of the room? I, I'll be, yeah, we'll be signing, and I'll be signing. I don't know if you... Oh, down, down the front, sorry. Down, I'll be, Purchase I'll in the back. Them. But I do want to... Books wanna, are down the front. I, I do want to personally thank you, Charlie, for agreeing to do this tonight, because I really oh. appreciate it. And so th I'd like to thank Charlie, because he's... A, 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 a thank and would you please also thank Lawrence Krauss. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be back. Thank you.